Hello, and welcome to CSDW's podcasts and broadcasts. This is Writer's Talk. I'm Doug Dangler. I'm fortunate to be joined today in the studio by Dr. Peter Mansour, who has 26 years of distinguished military service, and he rose to be a brigade commander in Iraq and the executive officer for General David Petraeus. He's now the Raymond E. Mason Jr. Chair of Military History at The Ohio State University. His research interests include modern U.S. military history, World War II, and counterinsurgency operations. He's written two books. The latest is Baghdad at Sunrise, an exceptionally detailed first-hand account of his time in Iraq in 2002 and 3 as commander of the 1st Brigade, 1st Armored Division, the Ready First Combat Team. Welcome, Dr. Mansour. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. Let's start with the, uh, the very detailed nature of your text. I'm curious. You kept a combat journal, I read, and you relied on many sources in the book, which you're evidenced by the bibliography in the back. Uh, your level of detail even extends to noticing when you were getting uh, spaghetti dinners too frequently. Now, uh, I often can't recall what I've had for lunch the day before. Uh, just how detailed were your journals uh, prepping for this book? Well, first, I really had no intention of writing a book when I went to Iraq. What I mm -hmm. wanted to do was record my experiences for my kids mm -hmm. and then my grandkids and maybe have these journals that get passed down as family lore. So it was a wide variety of things, uh, both human interest mm -hmm. and, uh, and more uh, substantial in terms of problems that we had to overcome. When I got back though, and I read through the journals, I realized that no one was going to be able to make sense of them because they were very scattershot and there were actually two journals that I kept. So I decided that at that point that I would turn this into a family manuscript uh, and write a, the history of my biography, my memoirs of that time in Iraq. But as I began writing, I realized I had a, uh, a larger message that uh, I thought was good for a wider audience. And that's when I decided to actually write a book. And that's when I began pulling in more than just what was in my journals. In, it's funny because you give a, a not always flattering account of what happened there and uh, of some senior military decisions and presence. You describe the aftermath of one attack as, quote, everyone was doing what needed to be done except for the large number, or number of colonels and lieutenant colonels from CPA and CJTF who showed up to help, but merely added unneeded mass to an already overcrowded scene. <laughs> I'm wondering if uh, descriptions like that have led to responses from any senior officials who said, I didn't, you know, we were there helping. We didn't get, we weren't unneeded mass. Well, because I don't name names, of course, they can remain <laughs> anonymous. Uh, I've received on the whole very positive feedback from my peers in the military, my colleagues mm -hmm. uh, who I worked with. Um, Every now and then you have someone who says, well, this piece of it, I had a different perception of what was going on, mm -hmm. or I didn't really agree with your characterization of this CPA policy, Coalition for Visual Authority. But on the whole, uh, the response has been very, very positive, mm -hmm. and people have said this is the book that needed to be written. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, uh, when you say something like this CPA, the uh, uh, Provisional Authority, uh, it it's interesting because you provide a glossary of military acronyms at the front of the book, which is especially helpful for somebody like me who has very little military background. Uh, in writing this memoir, did you feel a lot of influence from that? Did you have to, did you start off with one sort of acronym version and then open it up for a wider audience? I, uh, I actually wanted this to be a work for the general public, so I, I wrote it and as open as I could with this, as few military terms as possible. Mm -hmm. And then when I read through it again, I said, wow, there's a lot of military terms in there. So I reduced it even more and spelled more of them out and whatnot. And then I was feeling pretty good about myself and I, I sent the uh, manuscript to the editor. And the editor, Dan Heaton, who's a University of Illinois graduate, works for Yale University Press, really a great editor. And he, he did a masterful job, but he sent a note back and he said, if Spanish and English is, Span is Spanglish, then Army and English is Armish. And you write in Armish. <laughs> and, and he did uh, an even better job in turning uh, my Army speak, if you will, into the King's English mm -hmm. and helped uh, make it even more broadly accessible. Even after that, I was thinking, well, okay, now it's ready for the general public. I've gotten a lot of feedback saying... Boy, I'm glad you provided that glossary up front, but you really use a lot of acronyms, and uh, mm -hmm. this is, would be hard to understand otherwise. 
and I thought I had dumbed it down a lot. <laughs> Uh, for for a lay audience, yes, is, uh, which I guess says something about army culture and the way we use uh, sp specialized terms. Well, it, it, here was the tension there, and that is, I wanted it to be authentic enough that military people could read it and say, "Yes, this is an authentic account of what happened," and yet be accessible to the general public. If you dumb it down too much, the military people will just dismiss it mm -hmm. as being elementary, uh, and so that was the fine line I was walking. In this case, you're really writing a piece of the public military historical record. And how did that affect you as you wrote about it? Well, there was a variety of audiences I was, I was looking at. Um, there was the general public who I wanted to inform you know, what went on that first year, because there was a lot of misinformation in the media, mm -hmm. people who were writing about Iraq who hadn't really spent a lot of time over there. And I wanted to let the American people know this is what happened that first year, at least in one corner of Iraq. Uh, another audience then was my fellow military officers who I felt really needed to come to grips with counterinsurgency warfare and what warfare in the 21st century is going to be like and the kind of things that we needed to study and, and discuss and the kind of organizational changes we, need to, we needed to uh, implement in order to be ready to fight these kind of wars, which I think are going to be with us for some period of time. And then the final audience was the policymakers in Washington, who, uh, quite frankly, I think, um, you know, created, uh, uh, made strategic errors of the first order in going into Iraq in the first place, and then in the way some of the decisions they made once we were on the ground. And that was an, another audience that I was trying to reach. Uh, and the manuscript has to then uh, cater to each one of those audiences in different ways. Uh, so there are things like humorous episodes with uh, um, spaghetti and shakes and so mm -hmm. forth, uh, but then there's also some really serious discussion mm -hmm. of what went wrong and how, what we need to do to fix it. And there's a part at the end of the book, uh, the final chapter is called Reflections, and it's sort of the lessons learned portion of it that, um, as, I, as I was reading through it, reminded uh, reminded me that you had written, uh, believe the, or had a part in rewriting the counterinsurgency manual for the army, and I thought this is really uh, probably something that also grew out of that experience and writing about that, because it seems to me that a lot of this stuff, as you've described it, um, is a big switch from the the U.S. military going from a having this ability to come in and, and wipe out sort of a. Uh, do regime change pretty easily, but then figuring out what to do afterwards is a, is a problem. Yeah, I, I was uh, what Conrad Crane, the principal author of Field Manual 3-24 Counterinsurgency, calls a secondary author. I helped to edit the first draft of the document, and then I made some substantive contributions to the final version. Uh, that was a good experience, but I had been thinking about counterinsurgency warfare for a while. Uh, ever since my days at Ohio State when I took a class in revolutionary warfare with my Ph.D. advisor, Alan Millett. Uh, in fact, the education I received here at Ohio State in that regard was at every bit or even better than uh, my professional military education, which tended to ignore uh, counterinsurgency warfare, revolutionary warfare, low-intensity conflict. You know, this is a cultural issue with the United States Army. Uh, it prides itself on its ability to fight and win big, large unit, high intensity wars. And the Army has to shift and adjust in this century, at least in the near term future, because the kind of wars we're liable to be fighting are not those kind. And this was one of the, the lessons and one of the messages in Baghdad at sunrise that we need to come to grips with this because it's not going to go away. However much we might wish to fight the kind of wars that we want to fight, the quick regime change uh, over in, in a matter of weeks. and come home to the victory parades, that's not the way it's likely to be, at least uh, in the foreseeable future.